recently met me, some of you have known me for a lifetime, but I want to give you a brief description of who I am and why, you, why should you listen to me. So, growing up my whole entire life, growing up my whole entire life, I was overweight. Extremely overweight, extremely, extremely unhealthy. To give you an example, this is what I used to look like. This is when I was 24 years old. I was 24 years old and I felt like I was in the body of a nine-year-old man. I was very unhealthy. I hadn't worked out my entire life. I only played basketball. I didn't know what fitness was. I didn't know how to eat right. I decided to make a change. I committed to my health. I committed to my diet. I committed to my exercise. And I was 100% committed. For nine straight months, I was 100% committed. I was at barbecues. I didn't have beer. I didn't cheat. I allowed myself maybe one cheat meal per month. I was just so focused on my goal. And then you fast forward to that. I lost 80 pounds. This was me when I was 24 years old. I lost 80 pounds. I went from 242 nearly 250 pounds to around 170. Uh, my body fat dropped from 32% to down 6 to 6% 6 body fat. I finally had a six pack my whole entire life. I always dreamed of having six pack abs. Not, not that that's the most important thing, but for my entire life it was important to me. I finally achieved that and I was so excited about that that it helped snowball into a career in health and fitness. So I started my own personal training company shortly after this. I got involved with this gym, which I'm a partner in, and uh, I'm starting to write books on, this, on the subject as well. And my passion is helping people who feel like they are stuck at a certain weight loss, who feel like there's another way but to get medication or to have some sort of surgery. I want, them to sh I want to show them that there is a different way. There's another approach you can take. And that's why I am passionate about this stuff, and that's why I'm so happy to see all your faces here, because there's going to be 40 people who are going to learn this information, and hopefully you can implement this stuff. Um, so I just want to give you a brief little video summary of my transformation, so go to the next slide, and then here. The weight melted off, 10 pounds, 30 pounds, 50 pounds, and then finally a weight loss of 72 pounds of pure fat. I went from being obese with a 32% body fat to carving out a rock hard six pack with 6% 6 body fat. Every single one of my health problems diminished. This is the healthy, confident person I always wanted to be. There isn't a medication you can take, a jazzy car you can buy, makeup, clothes, jewelry, or shoes that will make you feel the way you do when your body is fit and healthy. You can do it. You will do it. I will help you. We can get done together. that's your goal because usually it's synonymous with overall optimal health but even more important than a physical six-pack is a mental six-pack and what I mean by that is like are you constantly striving are you constantly reading every day are you reading studies are you making yourself better are you growing mentally and it's so important to grow mentally because if it wasn't for the books that I have in my life and my life would be completely different the books completely transform transform my life they save me pretty much so that's why I have my recommended book list and I would encourage you to Go through it at the end of the session, see what books stand out to you, and then you can buy yourself. I'm not selling them, but you can buy yourself on Amazon for a few bucks. Um, so going back to my story, after I started my personal training company, I was down to the body weight that I wanted. I started experimenting with different diets, different lifestyles. I went from, I was a vegan. I know we have a few vegans in here. I was a vegan for 15 months. So for about a year and a half, I was a vegan. I was a strict vegan. That means I had no honey, nothing from an animal. No eggs, no dairy, nothing from an animal. The first, and uh, let me preface this with saying that, this is my story, this is my experience. Everybody is different. We have what's called biochemical individu individuality. We all have different genetics, different genes. So what, this is my story. It doesn't mean it's gonna be the same for you guys. If you are a vegan or you know somebody who is. So six months into my vegan diet, 
Uh, I had experienced a lot of benefits from it. I detoxed my body, my skin was clear, I, was, I had a lot more energy, my body fat dropped. I felt wonderful. At the six month mark, I started to, my benefits started to decline. So I, I, my therapeutic benefits depleted and I started to struggle with my energy levels. I started to struggle with my workouts. Uh, my body fat kind of increased a little bit. I was so sore after workouts for days. I didn't know, you know, if I had to work out less, if I was doing something wrong. So I started reading about veganism and I started reading about other diets and how sometimes vegan diets are not the best for everybody. So I wanted to experiment. So at that point, I was totally set on being a vegan. I, I loved it and I wanted to make sure that it was for me. It was at the six month mark that I felt that way, but it took me 15 months to, to kind of get out of it. So what I did is I got into this guy named Paul Check, who was one of the top nutrition guys in the world. And he was talking about how the vegan diet could sometimes be detrimental to some guys because of the fact that when you're on a vegan diet, you're not eating any cholesterol. When you're not eating any, any cholesterol, you're not producing a lot of androgens. When you're not producing a lot of androgens, your testosterone, which is like what we guys want to be high, that kind of starts to drop. So that's what happened to me. My testosterone plummeted. So I did a blood panel to make sure that this is what was happening. I looked at my blood work. My testosterone went from, well, I didn't know what it was before, but it dropped all the way down to 242, which is, I don't know if you guys know anything about that, but for a guy, uh, that's the testosterone of about a nine-year-old man. And I was 27 years old at the time, and I had the testosterone of a nine-year-old man. So that's why I was struggling. That's why I had no energy. Um, so I decided to get off of the vegan diet to experiment to eat more animal products, organic, grass-fed stuff that we're going to talk about. Five months down the line, I wanted to test out the same blood work that I got done, see how I felt. I made a lot of strength gains. My energy levels increased. Put on 10 pounds of muscle. Uh, these were just physical attributes. I wanted to see the blood work to see what was happening in my body. And I did the same blood work and I looked at my testosterone again. And it went from 242 to 1003. So the, the highest limit is 1100. So I was like right there. To give you an idea, that was that's the testosterone of a, a teenager, a hormone driven teenager that we all these guys experience when we were growing up. So I experimented with that and I figured out okay, the vegan diet is not working for me as a sustainable approach, but it might be a good thing for me to go back to to detox my body every once in a while. So I, was a, I got off the vegan diet and then I experimented what's called the ketogenic diet. A ketogenic diet is pretty much a very high fat diet. 70% of my diet or more was from fats, healthy fats. And then moderate protein and very low carbs. I did that for about six months. I even tested my blood ketones every day to make sure I was in a ketogenic state. And that worked great for me for about four months and then I started to, uh, my health benefits started to diminish, so I got off of that. Now I do what's, what I call a qualitarian diet. What is that? I just want to eat quality food. I'm going to go over what I'm talking about. So I just wanted to give you an idea that I have experimented. I have read a lot of stuff and I don't try to close myself in a box. I would encourage all of you guys to do the same thing. So all the information you're going to learn today, you might be like, I don't agree with that. I heard different. Like, he's crazy. That's fine. But I would encourage you to get out of here and experiment and do your own research. Like when I read a book, I read a book on an idea and I want to read another book on the exact opposite of that idea. So I want to form, that book's going to have a thesis, a book that's completely different is going to have an antithesis, your antithesis, and I want to form my own synthesis. So I want you guys to get this information, experiment, form your own synthesis, and see what works for you. Next one. Let's get down to the keys of fat loss. So number one, sleep smart. That's the, notice it doesn't say get a lot of sleep, it says sleep smart. So it's quality over quantity. Great sleep is the ultimate fat burner. It's all about hormone function. When you're trying to lose weight, it's all about getting your hormones in balance with each other. And you do that with this quality sleep. And I'm going to talk about how you do that in a second. So what are hormones? Hormones are pretty much chemical messengers that all your cells in your body use to communicate with each other. So if your hormones are not communicating properly, if you have something out of whack, you can have one part of uh, half of your cells saying, trying to communicate to the other half. This half could be saying, hey, we're going to meet tonight at Aventura, 8 p.m. We'll see you there. And then the other half of yourselves will be like, they're not going to get the message. They're going to end up in Tallahassee, and they're going to be lost. That's a silly example, but it just gives you an example of how your body knows communicating with each other. Um, so with sleep deprivation, it dramatically reduces human growth hormone secretion and testosterone production. I just spoke about how important testosterone is, especially for guys. Human growth hormone. You hear that a lot with athletes like Barry Bonds and a lot of these players, they take that um, through injections and stuff like that, but your body also in, in produces it naturally. So you can produce human growth hormone with your body naturally. 
And you do that with getting quality sleep. So there's no other physiological process that has more bearing on your hormone function than sleep does. Not diet, not exercise, nothing. Sleep is the real deal. And that's why it's number one of my keys. So we are a part of nature. Our circadian rhythm, our hormone rhythms, I spelled that incorrectly, are lined up with what the planet is doing. Take advantage of money time window. So first of all, the circadian rhythm, that's when the sun goes up, we are with nature. We know that our cortisol, which is our stress hormone, rises. Our melatonin, which is our rest and relaxation, drops. So when you wake up in the morning, they have an inverted relationship, cortisol and, and melatonin. Melatonin is an antioxidant and it's a hormone. You wake up in the morning, cortisol is up. At least this is the way it's supposed to be when you're healthy. Cortisol is up, melatonin is low. As the day goes by, the sun goes down, melatonin goes up, cortisol goes down. This is a healthy person right there, but a lot of the time people are not healthy, their hormones are out of whack, so their cortisol stays up even at nighttime, and you're out of whack with nature. There's a period of sleep called money time, the money time window. All experts agree to this. So between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. This is when you get most bang for your buck when it comes to recovery and regener uh, regenerative pro uh, properties. So one hour of sleep within this window is equal to two hours of sleep outside this window. So if you get if you could get any, if you could get four hours in there, that's like the best. 10 p.m., 2 a.m. If you get any kind of sleep within that window, that's the best time to do it right there. You get double the benefits. Uh, so when you're sleeping, it's an anabolic state. You're building up. You're repairing. When you exercise, it's a catabolic state. You're tearing down. We need both. We need a balance. So let me give you an example. This is really fascinating. Let's say. George, I'm giving you, I'm giving you my example. You come to the gym on Monday, because I see you every day. Which, by the way, you're doing awesome. You're losing so much weight. You come every day, you're in front of the gym, you're in front of the board. We're going over the workout with you. We're going to be doing deadlifts, we're going to be doing some handstand pushups, some crazy stuff, crazy crossfit stuff. You're in better shape looking at the board before you work out than you are after your workout. Like, you are in better shape. The, the reason being, when you're working out, it's a stressor to your body. You're causing inflammation in your body. So if you, I were to do a blood panel with you before and after, and like I looked at your hormones right after, I would see that as cortisol would be through the roof from the workout, your insulin levels would be so high that you could be diagnosed as a pre-diabetic just from your workout, depending on how tough your workout was. And so I'm trying to point, paint the picture to show you that this is a, a big stressor. And a lot of you are CrossFitters at the gym, a lot of you are members here. So it's important that you are getting your, your stressor because without the catabolic state, you cannot repair and grow stronger, so you need that. But you also need to have that amount of sleep and recovery to repair yourself. So if you're not getting that anabolic deep sleep, especially between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., you're not recovering properly. And Dutch. So Dutch is a member here, and he's been also doing great. I saw him, I think it was two months ago, you were doing one of my classes, and I saw you, you were burning yourself out. You were here every day, and I'm not, I'm not picking on you, I'm giving you, it's an example, but it's a good example. He was burning himself out, and I saw him, and I said, Dutch, you know, you got to, why don't you just relax for the rest of the workout? You know, he wanted to push himself, which is good. It's a good mentality to have, but you also have to be wise about it. And he ended up pushing himself. I saw that he was, you know, drenched in sweat. I, I could see that he was burning himself out because he was there every single day. Two days later, the next day, he ended up in the hospital, right? He was, he had a burn, he was burned out. He was dehydrated. He was in the hospital for like three days. So ever since then, you've been smarter. You've been coming maybe every other day or two or three days, four days out of the week, not five days, six days in a row, and you, you're getting even more results, right? Yeah. You're slimming down, you're getting a lot more results. So that's a pure prime example to why sleep and recovery is so important, especially when you're crossfitting. And I know you want to be here every day and you want to make some strength gains, but you're not going to do that if you're not recovering properly. This is my favorite thing I'm going to talk about today. So, I don't know if you guys know about telomeres. Telomeres are so interesting. They are little plastic casings at the end of your chromosomes, your DNA. All of us have this. So they kind of look like, you know when you buy a pair of shoes and you have those plastic encasings at the end of your shoes to keep them together, the strands? I don't know what they're called, they're called eaglets or something like that, eaglets, silly word like that. <laughs> so they're like the eaglets to your DNA. This is what they look like. This is your DNA, your chromosomes, they're at the, they're at the end of all of your uh, DNA. So all experts agree on this one thing. Experts don't agree on a lot of things, like vegan diet, non vegan diet, but they agree on this one thing, and that is, if you look at somebody's telomeres and the shortening of it, you can determine how long they're gonna live. So the sh as you age, you 
automatically your telomeres shorten. It happens with age, but your lifestyle factors determine how fast they shorten. So if they shorten quick, quickly and quickly, quicker and quicker because of your diet, because of you're not getting enough sleep, because you're eating a lot of sugar, it's because you're unhealthy, you're gonna be susceptible to cancer, to Alzheimer's, you're, you're gonna be more susceptible to all these diseases. So that's the one biological marker that you can test and see to how long someone's gonna live. So you can actually reverse aging by practicing this principle right here. So extending your telomeres is one of the most promising strategies recommended by some of the leading anti-aging biologists and experts in the world. It is, without question, one of the most exciting methods that holds great promise to actually reverse aging. Next slide, Rob. It was previously believed that you could, not, you could only accelerate the shortening of telomeres, not slow it down. But now research has shown there are factors within your control that actually shows slow, that actually slow telomere shortening as well. Sleep deprivation is the most powerful influence on accelerated loss of your telomeres. More powerful than smoking cigarettes, than doing drugs, than exercising chronically, sleep deprivation is the most powerful influence. That's, I can't even say that enough. So what is the most effective way to shorten your telomere? Sleep, quality sleep. And we're gonna talk about now how you can get better sleep. Solutions to better sleep. Number one, adjust the temperature. Studies have shown that the optimal range of deep quality sleep is between 60 degrees and 68 degrees. So set your thermostat very low. I know it sounds cold, but just warm it up. Warm up. 68? 60 and 68 degrees. Yeah. That's for adults. I don't know if I can tell you for kids. <laughs> um, so I set my thermostat at 66, 67 degrees, and I and I that's what I prefer. So also make your room. Also, I wanted to say this. I know all you guys have a lot of questions as I'm going to talk today. Write them down at the last at the end of the session. The last 30 minutes, I'm going to go through a Q and A. So don't worry about me not answering your questions. I'm going to answer everything. Just write it down. Can yes. I record this? Yes, you can. You may record it. Good Thank question. you. <laughs> So number two, tip number two, make your room as dark as possible. Unplug everything that, that glows, cover your windows with black curtains. Yes, it might feel like you were about to begin with three month hibernation, but you were gonna sleep like a baby. So I have blackout windows and it's important for this. The reason being is because, um, first let's get to the next tip. Stay there. Turn off electronics at least one hour before bed. This is probably the hardest thing to do to get off the laptop and stop looking at Facebook. Even for me, it's very tough. And I, I always Snapchat like stuff I'm reading if you guys follow me on Snapchat, which I'm always posting at night. So I'm guilty of this too. Uh, research has shown that nighttime light exposure suppresses the production of melatonin. Remember, I just spoke about this. It's a hormone and it's an antioxidant. And you need it to be very high at night so you can get that deep quality sleep. But when you are having all this blue light, which is light from your laptop, light from a, a bowl, you're not getting this melatonin benefit. You're getting cortisol spike and they have an inverse relationship. When you, when you get that light touching your skin, you shoot out that cortisol, and it kind of blocks melatonin, like like the tumble, it gives them a finger, like, no. Um, so, <laughs> I also set my phone to airplane mode at night because it eliminates electromagnetic frequencies that are within your Wi-Fi, within your phone. There was a study, this is really interesting, in the University of Michigan, I believe it was, they had uh, participants in a completely dark pitch black room, they had stuff connected to them, they would put a little laser light, a little white light like you get from your laptop behind their kneecap and they would shoot out cortisol. They would shoot out cortisol and their melatonin would go down. So your room needs to be pitch black. I'm talking about if you have an alarm clock, put a, something over it, cover it up. And there's lights that you can buy that hide blue light and you can purchase that online as well, but it needs to be pitch black. Okay, go to the next one. Bedtime supplementation. My favorite, I take magnesium every single day. So I would recommend taking magnesium 400 milligrams, 30 to 60 minutes before bed. Too much will result in diarrhea, AKA disaster pants, so you don't take too much. <laughs> it's a muscle relaxant, but it might get some too many things out of you. The most observable forms are any of the eights. So magnesium citrate, glycinate, taurate, three and eight, and aspartate. I personally like three and eight, that's my favorite. Next slide. Potassium, synergistic with magnesium. This combination will remove nighttime light cramps for most people. So if you're susceptible to getting cramps in the middle of the night, we know how much that sucks. You yell and you scream. Uh, take some potassium. You get potassium from uh, avocados. So avocados actually have more potassium than bananas. But you can also take it in a supplement form. A uh, recent study demonstrated that may indicate that improvement in sleep consolidation with potassium supplementation. So 
400 to 500 milligrams of potassium, about 30 to 60 minutes before bed. Citrate is my favorite. Next. Raw organic honey. So, one to two teaspoons of raw honey before bed helps with your sleep. This is because during the night, your brain uses a lot of energy. One efficient form of brain energy comes from sugar stored in your liver called glycogen. I'm going to talk more about this a little bit later. Your brain taps into your liver glycogen stores, hitting your muscle glycogen, stores sugar in your muscles. So, having a little extra sugar before bed can help your brain function better at night. So, a little honey before night, one to two teaspoons. Also, make sure it's raw because it's 22% more effective. Next one. All right, let's go to fat loss key number two. Another favorite of mine, intermittent fasting. I've been doing intermittent fasting for, it's gonna be two years now in July. What is intermittent fasting? So essentially it is going, it's not cutting calories. A lot of people think that it, I'm telling you to cut calories extremely, no. It's about eating all of your calories within a certain six to eight hour window. So I'm gonna give you an example. For me, I usually have dinner around 9 p.m. I will not have my next meal until 1 or 2 a.m. So I would have fasted 16, 17, 18 hours. And a lot of great things start happening this way when we do this. So, next slide. Are you a sugar, are you a fat burner or are you a sugar burner? When you are practicing intermittent fasting, you are converted from a sugar burner to a fat burner. Next slide. So intermittent fasting shifts your body from, a, from burning short of sugar and carbs to burning fat as its primary fuel. The reason being is that you have, you store your carbohydrates in your liver and your muscles called glycogen stores, which we just spoke about. When you're fasting, when you're sleeping, you're fasting. You're not eating anything. So you're tapping into those glycogen stores for energy, even while you sleep. When you wake up in the morning, you usually break that fast. That's why it's called breakfast. Let's say you don't break that fast. You're gonna oh. deplete your glycogen stores and you're gonna go into your fat stores and you're gonna start burning fat for fuel. Doesn't it make total sense? <laughs> a lot of awesome things also start happening. So our body, we are hardwired for the old school. It does not know that we have a fridge stocked full of food, a whole food across the street, we can get any kind of food we want. It doesn't know that. So when you're in a famine state, it thinks, shit, we're gonna die if we don't find some food. So all these amazing things start happening in your body. Your testosterone skyrockets. Your body needs to keep you alive to find food. Testosterone goes up, your brain functions better. Your body needs to keep you alive to hunt to find that food. Um, next slide. Okay, it usually takes several weeks to shift from a fat burning mode to a, uh, but once you do, what your cravings for unhealthy foods and carbs will automatically disappear. Some people, it takes a few days. It depends on who you are. For me, it took me like, I think seven days to make that shift, but Intermittent fasting is not for everybody. It works for me, and it, it, most of the time it works for guys. But for women, I've, I've seen with my clients, it probably works 50% of the time. So one out of two, you will you get some benefits from it. And there's, you don't have to do it every single day. Go to the next slide. This video is gonna demonstrate a, well, I'll get to the video. It's gonna demonstrate how, how you can do it, and there's ways to modify it. So I already mentioned that a study showed that intermittent fasting triggered 1,300% rise in human growth hormone. That's when you repair yourself. In women, and an astounding 2,000% in men. Your body needs to keep you alive to find food, so it's gonna, all these great things will start happening. A study shows that cycles of prolonged fasting not only protects against immune system damage, so if you're sick, you have a flu, fast it out. That's the best thing to do, that's what I do. Uh, major side effect of chemotherapy, but also induce immune system regeneration. So. Shifting stem cells from a dormant state to a state of self-renewal. So your, your cells in your body start to renew itself. It gets rid of the damaged ones and it renews yourself because it has to keep you alive to find that food. It's amazing. It's amazing. Next slide. <laughs> Other health benefits of intermittent fasting include preserving memory function and learning, reducing inflammation, lessening free radical damage, improving biomarkers of disease, Normalizing your insulin leptin sensitivity, which is key for optimal health. Normalizing your ghrelin levels, which is known as the hunger hormone. Lowers risk of coronary artery disease and diabetes, and it lowers your triglyceride levels. So, go to the next slide. Losing weight and staying fit can be exhausting and tedious. You'll need hard work, an effective workout routine, and a stringent diet for you to achieve the healthy physique that you've always dreamed of. But beware, most diet fads today pull you into a never-ending cycle of deprivation and misery. 
without the results you're looking for. The result? You give up on your fitness goals. But wait, here's a revolutionary strategy that can help you reach optimal fitness and provide you with incredible health benefits. Introducing Intermittent Fasting, a simple technique to burn fat fast. Intermittent fasting is a scheduled eating plan that restricts your normal daily eating to a specific window of time. It's based on the concept of feast and famine, the same eating pattern that our ancestors followed, as opposed to the 24-7 non-stop eating habit that many people are guilty of today. So why does intermittent fasting feed other diet strategies? When you eat, your body spends a few hours processing food, burning what it can from what you just consumed. But when you're in a fasted state, your body doesn't have a recently consumed meal that it can burn as energy. Instead, it uses your stored fat as its primary energy source, helping you trim down those nasty pounds. Intermittent fasting also triggers a cascade of health benefits such as boosting your metabolism and reducing weight gain, increasing your insulin and leptin sensitivity to keep diseases like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer at bay, preventing inflammation and free radical damage, supporting healthy bacteria in your gut, normalizing your ghrelin levels or the hunger hormone to prevent food cravings and promoting the production of human growth hormone. HGH, a fat-burning hormone crucial for health and fitness. When combined with a regular well-rounded workout routine like high-intensity interval training, intermittent fasting can be a successful strategy to ensure your longevity and overall health. So how should you start? You can do alternate day fasting. Fast for 24 hours once or twice a week. Or here's a very simple technique. Try eating later and later into the morning until you're skipping breakfast and lunch becomes your first meal of the day. At night, stop eating at least three hours before you sleep. This restricts your eating time to six to eight hours as you fast for 14 to 16 hours per day. Start doing intermittent fasting at least once or twice a week and then gradually adjust your schedule until you're doing it every day. What you eat matters when doing intermittent fasting. Avoid loading up on heavy carbs and choose moderate amounts of high-quality protein and healthful fats. Stay away from unhealthy processed drinks and opt for pure clear water to quench your thirst. And don't forget, eat healthy on non-fasting days as well. One final tip, always listen to your body when doing intermittent fasting. It's an excellent and powerful way to take your health and fitness to the next level. Kind of a general approach to it. So now that we talked about skipping breakfast, let's talk about eating breakfast. If you're gonna eat breakfast, which you should on some days, I even eat breakfast once in a while. Uh, let's talk about what you should eat. So people say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I say breakfast is the most dangerous meal of the day. A lot of people set their day up for a disaster right from the get-go, right when they wake up. So do you find that eating breakfast makes you hungry soon after? Thereafter, if so, you're likely eating the wrong kind of breakfast food. So what you want to stay away from in the morning is sugar, carbs, grains. You want to eat mostly protein. You want to eat mostly fat. And I'm going to talk about what fat and protein is specifically. Uh, the most common mistake people make with their breakfast is to typically eat breakfast foods, which are like cereals and oatmeal and bagels. These are not what you want in the morning. Next slide. What you want to do have, what you want to have in the morning, are these options right here. And sorry, vegans, I'm sorry. There's bacon and eggs on there. If you're not a vegan, go ahead and eat your bacon and eggs. Protein and fat, that's fine. You have some saturated fat, and I want to talk a lot about saturated fat foods that I recommend. And you're probably wondering, you know, aren't isn't saturated fat going to cause heart disease? In your cheat sheet, you're going to do some research in there. You're going to realize that it's actually been debunked. It's a myth. The right kind of saturated fats are not going to influence your heart disease at all, and you'll see that in your cheat sheet when you get out of here. So, eggs, bacon, whey protein, plant protein, tempeh, which is a fermented soy, natto fermented soy. Berries are on there. So berries are a fruit, but I say it's okay to have it in the morning because berries are high in antioxidants and low in sugar. So it's a good way, a good approach to have in the morning if you want to have fruit. Uh, full fat coconut milk, kefir, chia seeds, black seeds, cheese, organic full fat cheeses. Never go for full for uh, low fat, reduced fat, fat-free items. When you hear those words, whenever you hear reduced fat or fat-free or, or uh, non-fat, 
I want you to think of two words, and those two words are chemical sh** and they're going to replace it with a carb filler and your body's going to store that as fat, so it makes no sense, just pick the full fat version. Next slide. So key points to remember when having breakfast. Uh, when you start your day with high carbs, you set yourself up for a roller coaster of energy levels throughout the day. So when you have those carbs, you get that spike in insulin, then you get that crash, you get that spike, you get that crash, and your energy levels are not going to be where you want it to be. If you have protein and fat, you're going to get a small spike in insulin, and it'll be a steady energy level. Practice intermittent fasting on some days, it has profound health benefits, we just spoke about that. Uh, when, when eating breakfast, stick with high quality protein and fat, low carbs. In your cheat sheet, you're going to see a list of what high quality protein, fat, and uh, carbs are and what the bad stuff are, so you take that with you. Next slide. Fat loss key number four, the science of fat loss. This is probably my least favorite key today. Not that it's not efficient and it's not going to work, but it's not my go-to approach only because I don't think it's as sustainable as the other ones. So let's talk about what it is, what I'm talking about here. So, go to the next slide. Your body has what's called a basal metabolic rate. Your basal metabolic rate is the amount of calories that you burn every day just to sustain life. So you could be sitting here on these uh, boxes all day long and you're burning calories and that's the amount of calories you're burning based off of your genetics, body composition, and age. Next slide. So uh, there's also a formula to calculate your BMR. Okay, so total daily expenditure. That is the amount of energy you're burning every day based off of your activity level as well. So what you do for a living, when you come and work out, this is the amount of energy that you're burning. So what you want to do if you're following this approach, and I'm not going to go into depth here, but I could talk to you afterwards if you want to learn more about this. Uh, you want to kind of like use this formula right here for men and this formula for women. Go to the next slide. Next slide. So I'm going to give you an example. Me, Ben Azadi, 185 pounds, 6 feet, 2 inches, 31 years old. If I'm using this formula, this is the formula for men. It's going to be 10 times 83.9, which is my weight in kilograms, plus 6.25 times 187.9, which is my height in centimeters, minus 5 times 31, which is my age, plus 5. So that, that's the formula for your BMR. That's how you calculate it. For me, my BMR is 1,800. Calories. So if I were laying on my couch all day watching sports, I would burn that amount of calories. I didn't even stand up. My total daily total daily energy expenditure is calculated by my BMR multiplied by a moderately active level, which is 1.55, which you'll see in the previous slide. I'm going to email you guys this stuff. So that's 2,887 calories. That's my total daily expenditure, energy expenditure. That's the amount of calories I'm burning based off of the fact that I'm on my feet all day training clients and I'm working out as well. So I want to create a 15% deficit, a calorie deficit. So 15% of that is 433, 2,400 calories. So my goal would be to have 2,400 calories each day and I would start burning fat based off of this approach. But there's a caveat. Out of those 2,400 calories, obviously it needs to be quality calories, healthy calories. But 40% of it has to come from pro protein, 30% has to come from carbs, 30% has to come from fat. This is the optimal percentage for me to lose fat and build muscle at the same time and sustain energy levels. It's very hard to follow this approach only because you have to be really committed to logging in all your food. And I know Janet is really good at that. She does it like a pro for months and she sends me that stuff. Awesome. So you have to be committed to it, and I don't think most people are committed to doing that for a long, for a long time. But if you have like an event that's coming up in a month, like you're going to wear a bathing suit or something like that, or you have a photo shoot, this would be a good approach to burn fat fast if you're going to stick to it. So that's why it's not my most favorite, but it is effective if you want to do it. And we can talk more about, if you're interested in that, we can talk more about it later. I didn't want to go into depth. Next uh, slide. Alright, nutrient timing, fat loss key number five. Does it matter when you eat? Yes, it does. Now, contrary to popular opinion, the morning is not the ideal time to eat large meals because during this time your body is in elimination of detox mode. We already talked about breakfast, how you don't want to have a huge carb filled breakfast. You know, when your metabolic system is operating well, you'll find that you have to go to the bathroom each morning like clockwork. This is important in order to effectively eliminate toxins and prevent disease. 
Unfortunately, constipation is an extremely common problem, and part of the reason for this is that your body is not set to eliminate properly due to poor diet and improper meal timing. So, if you are constipated or do not automatically eliminate every morning, the giant clue you need to re-examine what and when you eat. So, this might be TMI for you guys, but I, by, by like 2 p.m., I've gone to the bathroom like five times, four or five times. Like, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm not saying that that's what you guys should be doing, but I always tell them. I, always, I don't know why you have to that, but yeah. Thank you, thank you. It's hard work. But. I do have a constipation protocol that I uh, put together, so if you are constipated, we'll talk later, and I'll email you the protocol, which will help you go, get going in the morning. Uh, let's talk about pre-workout fuel. So, a uh, study in the Journal of Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise demonstrated that consuming whey protein, about 20 grams per serving, 30 minutes before resistance training, so if you cross it, 30 minutes before, uh, it boosts your body's uh, metabolism for as much as 24 hours after you work out. It appears as, through, as though the amino acids found in high quality whey protein activate certain cellular mechanisms, including mTORC1, which in turn promote muscle protein synthesis, boost thyroid production, and also protect against declining testosterone levels after exercise. This is a good method to follow if you are trying to put on a lot of size and maintain a low body fat. But if you're, if you're not trying to do that, I wouldn't, you don't have to really follow this approach. Uh, next slide. In practical terms, consuming 20 to 30 grams of whey protein with no sugar. Um, so if you are a vegan, plant protein, get plant-based protein. Uh, so 30 minutes before exercise, 30 minutes after would be a good idea, a better idea. Uh, it will help increase fat burning and muscle building. Like I said, that's if you're trying to seek muscle growth and strength training. Next slide. So here are some key points when it comes to nutrient timing. Have a light breakfast, mostly protein and fat. Eat most of your carbohydrates around your workouts and at nighttime. So a lot of the time people think they should have a very light dinner and they should have a big breakfast or a big lunch. I, I don't agree with that. I think that you should have light meals throughout the day and have your biggest meal at nighttime. The reason being is that when you have that huge meal, and it could be carbs at night, healthy carbs, you're gonna get that huge surge of glucose, insulin, it's gonna spike up your energy. When you're going to bed, it's gonna help you, you're not gonna have an energy crash because you're, you're gonna be asleep. So you're gonna get that reparative, regenerative process going on, you're gonna be in your sleep, it's gonna repair your body. So that's the best time to have carbs. Fruit for dessert is perfect. So if you wanna get your fruit in, have it for dessert. Uh, your biggest meal of the day should be at night and after your workouts as well, because when you're working out, you're depleting your glycogen stores, like I mentioned. So when you have a bunch of carbs after your workout, you're gonna refill those glycogen stores. It's gonna replenish those glycogen stores. It's not gonna be used as fat, it's gonna be used as fuel. So the best time to have your carbs after a workout and at nighttime. Next slide. All right, number six. We're getting down to the last two. Deep fat to lose fat. So I mentioned saturated fats, how I think they're extremely important for you, and you'll see the research in your cheat, cheat meal. Uh, to shred fat, you actually need to eat healthy saturated fats and plenty of them. Mono un unsaturated fatty acids, MUFAs, found in nuts, olive oil, and avocados have been shown to boost abdominal fat loss. Check out this study. When researchers in one study asked women to switch to a 1600 calorie high uh, mono unsaturated fatty, fatty acids diet, they lost a third of their belly fat in a month. These, these um, Women, they were already overweight, so keep in mind. Next slide. Fat is essential to your health because it supports a number of your body's functions. Some vitamins, for instance, must have fat to dissolve and nourish your body. Without proper amounts of fat, your hormones will become imbalanced. This can lead to weight gain, fatigue, and poor sleep. We already talked about how important hormones are and having that imbalance, so healthy fats help keep that imbalance. Next slide. So here are my top five favorite fats, at least for right now. Avocados are great. Like I mentioned, they have more potassium than a banana. They have high levels of magnesium. I personally put them in my shakes. I have them with eggs. Uh, they're, they're great for you. Butter and ghee, this is not for, for vegans, but if you are not a vegan, this is a good option for you. If you're gonna buy butter, stick with grass-fed butter. Kerrygold makes a good brand, and they sell it at Publix. A lot of you have tried it. Um, ghee is also a good option if you're lactose intolerant. Ghee should be okay for you guys. Coconut oil. The best cooking oil is coconut oil. It has a high smoke point, so it will not turn rancid when you're cooking with it. 
you want to make sure you get unrefined organic coconut oil. Don't get refined because it means it has been heated and it doesn't have all the nutrient properties intact. Get unrefined organic. Extra virgin olive oil is a good oil for dips and salad dressings. If you buy olive oil, make sure it's extra virgin. Make sure it's in a dark glass case because if it's uh, exposed to a lot of light, it's going to turn rancid very quickly. So store it also in a dark place like behind a, a shelf. Uh, Omega-3s are great. You can get that from salmon. If you are going to buy fish, you have to, I, I would highly recommend you buy wild caught and not farm raised. The difference between the two, farm raised has high levels of PCBs. So PCBs stand for polychlorinated biphenyls. Sounds like a fancy word. Pretty much it causes cancer in your body. It's a carcinogen. It's a known carcinogen. The fishes at farms are feed, they're fed with these high levels of PCBs, so it gets stored in their fat. You buy these farm fish, you eat it, it gets stored in your fat. When you buy a wild fish, it has very low levels of PCBs, so it's the healthier approach. So always go wild if you're going to buy fish. It's a little bit more money and it's harder to find, but you're eliminating that exposure to carcinogen, so I would highly recommend it. Next slide. All right, last key. Key number seven. This is going to be not what you expect it to be on here, but willpower. Simple science of willpower and self-control. Willpower has a bigger power than you think, much, much bigger. We now, we now know that willpower is a finite resource. What does that mean? When you wake up in the morning, you have a certain amount of willpower reserves. Let's say it's right here. You go through your day, you're on your way to work, some jerk cuts you off, stresses you out, your willpower reserves start to diminish. You get to work, your boss treats you like like he's a jerk and you, it starts to diminish. You're stressed out throughout the day, it starts to diminish. The next thing you know, your willpower reserves are depleted and you find yourself in the break room eating a bunch of Cheetos and a bunch of unhealthy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or you come home from work and you should have worked out, but you're like, screw it, I'm stressed out, I'm gonna sit on my couch, I'm gonna binge watch Netflix and eat a whole bunch of food. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This is really interesting stuff right here. So when your brain is fixated on that ice cream, let's just say it's ice cream, the feel-good chemical dopamine rushes through your brain. All of a sudden, all that matters in life is that sugary, creamy scoop of ice cream. The dopamine tells your brain you must consume that ice cream right now, no matter the cost, or suffer the ghastly consequences. <laughs> so to make matters worse, when your brain, your brain is now anticipating that imminent spike in insulin and energy, so it begins to lower your blood sugar levels without even eating it. It begins to lower your blood sugar levels. Um, Okay, this in turn makes you crave the ice cream even more. And the next thing you know, you're in line waiting to get your ice cream. You see, once you become aware of an opportunity to uh, score a reward, your brain squirts out dopamine and tells us that this is indeed what we need. This is why the more we think, this is why the more we think about the reward we want, the more important it becomes to us, the more we think we have to get it right now. This is especially problematic in today's modern world, which is in many ways literally engineered to keep us always wanting more. There's a really good book all about this and how they so much money that's engineered to get us craving these things. It's called Salt, Sugar, Fat and it's by Michael Moss it's in the, on the shelf over there. I would recommend you buy that. It's a hard read, but it's a really good read. Next slide. So the arch enemy of willpower is stress. The more stress we feel, the more likely we are to overeat, overspend, and do many of the things we regret shortly thereafter. Anything that causes stress, whether mental or physical, drains our reserve of willpower. Remember, I mentioned we have a certain amount of reserves that's going to drain if we're stressed out, and it reduces our capacity to self-control. Thus, we can, uh, thus, anything we can do to reduce stress in our lives and improve mood, both acutely and chronically, improves our self-control. So binge eating. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. I know some of you are, and I've spoken to you about binge eating. I used to struggle with this a lot. I, I, used, to mind, I used to eat mindlessly. I didn't even know why. I, was, I wasn't even hungry. I was just eating because I was like, okay, there's more space in my stomach, I'm going to go fill this. That was when I was overweight, and I was just eating, eating, and I was just binging, and I would wonder why, because I was stressed out, my willpower reserves were so low, my lifestyle factors were so unhealthy, and this is just it's a vicious cycle. Indulging often leads to guilt, followed by more indulging, followed by more guilt, and it's just a bad cycle, and I, I broke out of it, and if you're struggling with that, I sympathize with you, and I can help you break out of it as well. So the rush of glucose you get when you binge eat and energy is, is soon followed by a crash, obviously. So which, like stress, is a precursor to willpower failures. 
research shows that when blood sugar levels are low, we are more likely to give up on difficult tasks, vent our anger, to lash out at people, lash out on relationships, to uh, you're more like, likely to give up on difficult tasks, um, to stereotype others, and to even refuse to donate to charity. That's what we should do. <laughs> Next slide. So how do you raise your willpower reserves? This is a good question. An effective way to relax from the daily grind is to, sim is to simply relax. To recover from the daily grind is to simply relax. So the next time you face a willpower challenge, so if you're stuck in traffic and someone cuts you off, take a few deep breaths, relax, you know, think about something else. Think about, it gives you more time to catch your breath. It gives you more time to listen to an audio you want to listen to. Focus on something else instead of the jerk that's cut you off. Just try to relax. I know it's harder to do than it is saying, but just research has shown that simply slowing down your breathing like this increases your heart rate variability and it helps you resist the effects of stress and it strengthens your willpower reserves. So if, you, if your willpower reserves are drained, if you're on your way from home, uh, on your way home from work, and you're stuck in traffic, if you practice these exercises, by the time you get home, you'll have increased your reserves. So you can go home and you won't binge, you'll go to your exercise, so you can actually increase, increase your reserves. Okay. So the following are recommended ways to relax and increase your willpower reserves. They have been proven time and time after, time and time again. Go for a walk outside. If you have a dog, you can walk next to her. I walk my dog every day. Uh, read a good book. Listen to some soothing music. Drink a cup of tea. Do some yoga. Lie down and focus on breathing and relaxing your muscles. Garden, if you like to garden, and meditation. I know Christina knows all about meditation. Her husband Alex is an expert in that. So if you want to talk more about meditation, Christina over here is the one to go to after the class. Her husband's a pro, and he's taught me a lot. Uh, next slide. If you really want to stress-proof yourself and build up your willpower reserve, you want to start exercising. The bottom line is that nothing seems to improve self-control in all aspects of our lives like exercise. So if you get home from work and you're stressed out, but you said you were going to work out, go work out. Just do what you said you were going to do. You would feel so much better afterwards, and your willpower reserves would help increase. It would have gone to capacity. So the next time you're feeling too tired, short on time to work out, remember the bigger picture. Every workout you do replenishes your willpower and energy. Think of it as your secret weapon to staying on top of your game. Next slide. Last thing I'm going to talk about today. When you're struggling with your willpower challenge, I want you to review your whys. What will you get by staying strong? What's the big payoff? What's the end goal? What, who else will benefit from it? What will your life be like when these things are a reality? Are you willing to delay immediate gratification? To get there, to experience some discomfort in the present, to have that future. There is no long-term gain without short-term pain. Next slide. So I'm going to wrap up by saying, by showing you my one of my all-time favorite quotes by Charlie uh, Charles Munger. To get what you want, you have to deserve what you want. The world is not a crazy enough place to reward a whole bunch of undeserving people. <laughs> so a lot of people say, I want to do this, I want to do that. They're not taking the actions to get there and you're not going to be rewarded. If you're taking the actions to get there, the universe is going to conspire with you to get you the results you want. So I want you guys to all leave here with all this information. I want you to experiment. I want you to put in the work. And remember that if you, if you put in the work, you're going to get it. You're going to deserve to get it. All right? And I'm here to help you. And I'm also offering nutritional consultations if you want to meet up with me on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I'm giving you guys 50% off my regular fee for the first consultation. We can talk more about that. There's a form back there so you can fill out and I'll follow up with you if you want to have an official consultation. I'll take your body fat again. I'll give you a protocol to follow that's specifically designed for you. Uh, so that's the end of the presentation. I do want to go over any questions that you may have and I'll answer those and then we'll wrap up and get out of here. So does anybody have any, any questions for today? Uh, okay. Uh, can you email us the slides? I can email you the slides. I don't think I could email you the Prezi information. What I'm going to do, I'm going to format it into a PDF, and you'll have it like that. So it won't look like a fancy slide, but you'll have the information. Yes. Uh, Bart? So my question is around fasting. Um, yes. I like the idea of it, but the, the concept is based on your body's response system to stressors. So my concern would be uh, long term, as you grow older, when your body needs to have that um, stressor response system even more because your body's aging. Is there any study that shows that using it in this way long term reduces the probability of you being able to call it as you go Is there any study that, that shows what? I didn't hear the last that part. That if you use it in this way as a, as a kind of dietary um, uh, method, yeah. that it reduces the body's uh, propensity to be able to use that uh, uh, response system as you go 
Yes, there are studies that show that. There's a doctor called Joseph Mercola, Dr. Joseph Mercola. He has a ton of articles and a ton of studies. If you want, I'll uh, share that with you. We can go over it. But yeah, there's a bunch of studies that show even if as you age, it's beneficial to you. It's not the, not the, the, the practice of using it as um, a diet, diet or a method. Right. But does your body still have Yes, you're talking about, yeah, you're talking about not, not to lose body fat. But the, the cell regrowth and all that stuff. No. That so, sorry. Okay. So the idea of uh, your body responding to stresses. Yes. Yeah. The human body's way of responding to any kind of chance the body has. As you grow older, you need that even more because your body's deteriorating just by right. aging, right? So if we use this method in this way now, when you're relatively younger, is there any study that shows that using it in this way reduces the body's preparedness? To I don't know. I don't know if there's a study that shows See, that. That would be my concern, yeah. right? Because when you get older, you want to have that. Um, you want your body to have that ability. Right. Because the probability of you getting sicker or having some cell damage or something as you get older, you want to have that. So my only concern is that if we, it's kind of like the war cry wolf effect. If you call on that call and no, does it reduce the ability to call on that call? Yeah, that's a good question. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go into the Joseph McCullough's stuff and I'll experiment and I'll share with you what I find because he's the expert in that. That's a really good question. So we'll find out exactly the answer to that. Um, Siobhan. Another question related to fasting. So you mentioned that some people see results from fasting within a few days and others that they mostly women, uh, maybe in a few weeks. What type of results? weight loss or is it something, a change in the mood or how we feel, energy levels, like yeah. what type of fat, so what type of result? Weight loss is one of them. So your body fat reduces, energy levels start to increase, you start to have, notice you have more energy, you get more stuff done. It also, for me, it releases the burden of having to know that, okay, it's been three hours, I have to eat right now. So it releases that burden, that kind of stress, and that kind of used to stress me out and deplete my willpower. So it kind of reduces that aspect of it. And uh, just energy levels and weight loss. You know, and, and also for me, it helps me focus on things a lot more. I get a lot of tasks done when I'm in my fasted state. That's when I get most of my work done. Personal experience. George. Okay, how do you balance uh, uh, intermittent fasting with working out? And both of them the points out of the same day, what would that be? Yeah, so you work out in the morning. I will see you in the morning. So I always say work out in a fasted state. So you would work out and you wouldn't eat breakfast. If you want to tap, really tap into your fast stores, work out in a fasted state. But as soon as you're done working out, I want you to have a huge breakfast. And this time, with your breakfast, you're going to, you're going to have carbs because you worked out. So you could have your carbs have a, have a huge meal right after your workout. So that way you're not going to tap into your muscle and have any muscle, muscle wasting. So I would say if your goal is to lose fat, that's your primary goal, work out in a fast state. You're going to tap into more fat that way. Just have that big meal right after. Okay? Right. Okay. Um, if you're fasting, can you drink coffee? Yes, good question. So I do, <laughs> I do what's called, um, oh, so she, she, asked, she asked, if you're fasting, can you drink coffee? So yes, the, the answer is yes. I do what's called bulletproof intermittent fasting, and there's a book over there called The Bulletproof Diet, and it talks all about it. So you want to just make sure your coffee doesn't have any sugar, so it doesn't have any carbs, and it doesn't have any protein. You can put in fat in there. So I, I drink bulletproof coffee, which is, um, Coffee blend with butter and coconut oil. I don't know, it sounds crazy to some people, that's what I have. So it's all fat, there's no protein in diet, and no protein in uh, carbs, so it doesn't interfere with my blood sugar level. So you're still in the fast state. So just make sure it's just pure coffee. Okay? Uh, Janet. Okay, staying on that whole intermittent fasting thing, you mentioned that having honey at night to replace your blood condition yeah. stores for your brain. Does that count into the fasting period? So in other words, like the last time you're going to eat is 8.30 p.m. Do you have the honey at 8 or do you have the honey at like 11 p.m. and then it's... Yeah, so if you have it at 11 p.m. it's going to interfere with your fasting benefits. Fast. So, I mean, is your, end, is your end goal to lose body fat or is it to get better sleep? Are you struggling with both? You're going to kind of prioritize... I don't have problem with sleep at all. So then I would say don't even do the honey or have the honey after dinner. So you prioritize the intermittent fasting benefits. Yeah, so it depends on what your goal is. So it would count against fasting? It will count against yeah. fasting. Yes, it will. Yeah. Uh, Garth. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that uh, uh, with, with eating late in the, uh, towards the end of the day, uh, eating meals that are high in energy, um, but would that affect your ability to get into sleep? No, your it will. Is energized? It will help your ability to get into okay. sleep. Yeah, that's why I'm a big fan of it. When you have that large meal at night, 
it's going to put you in a, you're going to get that spike of energy, yes, but if you're eating about one to two hours before your meal, so after that huge meal, you're going to crash, but you're going to be in bed, so you're going to crash while you're in bed. And then that spike in insulin is going to help you repair your muscle. So the meal has to happen about two hours before sleep? I would say about <laughs> one to two hours, try not to do it too close to sleep, especially when it's a big meal, give yourself a little time to digest. So you get that spike, yes, you will get that, all those nutrients and that energy, but then it'll crash, you'll be in bed, and you'll, you'll go to sleep, and you'll for me, it works like a charm. Uh, Sole. Could you give us an example of what you eat from one day, like from the moment that oh, yeah. you wake up to like when you go to sleep? Yes. So when I wake up in the morning, I have my coffee. I have my bulletproof coffee, which is uh, organic coffee, French press brewed. I put that with my butter, grass-fed butter. I haven't been putting coconut oil, I've just been putting butter lately. So I have that around 8, 9 a.m. I will have my first meal of the day, usually around 1, 2 p.m. Like today, I haven't eaten anything. I had my last meal at 9 p.m. last night. I had my coffee, and it's already 1.40. I haven't had anything, so I'm gonna have my first meal now, 1 or 2 p.m., and it's usually a light meal, which is consisting of a protein. So it could be fish, it could be chicken, it could be fermented soy, with a lot of greens. So like arugula, spinach, baby spinach. So I'll have that. Two hours later, I'll have my Shakeology shake, which is the Shakeology scoop with like a nutritional shake, with almond milk and half an avocado. I'll work out, usually I work out in the afternoon, 6 p.m., 7 p.m., I'll have another protein shake with whey protein and Shakeology, and then I'll feast that night. I'll have a huge dinner, which will be quinoa or white rice or brown rice, about a cup of it, I'll have a bunch of vegetables, I'll have a protein source, and then I'll have some fruit for dessert. That's typically my diet and stuff, on a good day. Yesterday I had pizza, so it wasn't good. <laughs> no carbs for lunch? I would, you can have some carbs at lunch. I typically don't until I have my protein shake, which is like my second lunch. So you can have carbs, just make sure it's the healthy carbs. And you'll see in your sheet what exactly healthy carbs are, healthy protein, healthy fat. Take that cheat sheet, sheet with you, email me, I'll email you, you guys your results for your body fat, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. We'll, you can always follow up with me. Uh, I think Siobhan has another question. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, I like to work out in the morning, and sometimes I work out without eating, but then sometimes during the workout, I get lightheaded, I feel weak, kind of on the verge of fainting. Um, do you think that's because of, I wasn't eaten, or would maybe after fasting regularly and my body gets used to it, that would get better? Have you tried that doing it um, consistently, or was that like a one-time thing, and then you went back to the other routine, and then no, it's it like without, like unintentionally. Okay, I do not but it would happen consistently. But it would happen. More often than not. Okay, then I would say that it doesn't work for you. I would say okay. not to do that. So it doesn't work for everybody. It works for me and it works for mostly for a lot of guys, but for women, it's, sometimes they get that feeling during mm -hmm. their workout. So I would say have a light breakfast, protein and fat, so maybe some carbs, and then work out, and then go from there. Or like a protein shake before A whey breakfast. protein shake would be great, yeah. Okay. So yeah, so for you, I would recommend that. Okay. Yeah. George? Sometimes three quarters through the workout, I hit a wall, and then you can't, it's hard to is there a way to overcome that, and, or what is that? Start so trying to take some branched chain amino acids before your workout. Okay. You can do that in a fasted state as well. So branched chain amino acids, drink that about 30 minutes before. It should help with that, that wall. If not, you could. Have you tried working out in a fasted state? No. Try that. Okay. See if that helps. It might help. Okay. You're welcome. Bottles. What's a good uh, amount of time to work out in the morning? A good it's number. Not, uh, like a heart rate. To well, I wouldn't be so good. Yeah, I would say if you really push yourself, you can give yourself a 10 to 15 minute workout and then you're done. But you gotta be going, going, going within those 10 to 15 minutes, like really high intensity. So warm up a little properly, two minutes warm up. 10 to 15 minutes, get out of there. I know you have a lot of work to do, a lot of stuff to do, so get that 15 minutes and get out of there. If you're going hard for 15 minutes, it's sufficient. You'll get results. Okay, Danielle? What is the best to eat uh, between lunch and dinner? Uh, okay, any other questions? All right, guys, thank you so much. If you want to.